You can now get a 30-day trial to experience The Athletic for free. Visit the link in the description below to try it now. Hello, welcome to T4IRL. I am JJ Bull, and in this video, we're going to look at Nuno Espirito Santos Tottenham and how they play. And we're going to work out whether they're any good or not. We don't know, we'll find out later, because I'll tell you the answer at the end. Um, but this is what they look like. It's a 4-3-3, mostly. He's changed it a few times, and that becomes a 4-2-3-1 very easily. And when it, if Ali goes to this situation, because that's what he does, he's a 10 still, but also an 8. And they played a 4-4-2 diamond against Crystal Palace, which looks a little bit like... That's a diamond that we've made. That's what they played against Palace. It wasn't amazing, um, but we can look at why that is, because the thing with Nuno is that he, above all else, wants to minimise risk and maximise control. He wants to have control of games. Um, which is not too dissimilar to Tottenham's previous manager, not Ryan Mason, but Josie Mourinho. So we should look a little bit at that, but first let's look at what the obvious differences are from Nuno's Tottenham we've seen so far, because it's very, very early, compared to what happened last season. So what's changed at Spurs? I don't know why I'm shouting at you, but I just feel so enthused by what I've seen. Uh, or do I? So, so far what you've got is this 4-3-3 like we said. The player roles are something we should look at. So the fullbacks like to get high and wide. It's one of the reasons he brought in Emerson Royal uh, from Barcelona because he can attack up this wide area like a winger kind of. Jaffet Tinganga is not that sort of player. He's very much a centre-back who can play fullback. So that's one thing. Skip's come in as a six. He was on loan at Norwich last season in the Championship, played really well. And what Skip does is he tends to play in the width of the six yard box. I'm roughly there, which is also the same width as the center circle. Hmm. But he won't really move outside of this. Uh, if the team moves across to one side of the pitch, because they're quite narrow under Nuno, Skip will still operate in a similar sort of distance in this bit here. And the reason for that is that it allows Spurs to keep control of the game. Skip just plays nice, short, sharp passes, just recycles the play, protects the defense. That's what he's there to do. He's very much that sort of player. But that kind of role was what was fulfilled last season mostly by Pierre-Emile Hoiberg, who now plays as this kind of uh, shuttling wide midfielder. So although it's a central three, Hoiberg will often come to help out and support in the press, because something that Spurs do is set pressing traps all over the pitch. So their line of engagement, first line of engagement, is usually quite deep. Not this deep, but it sometimes can be. And when the opposition team has the ball, say, um, this is a made-up situation, just so you know. Say they're pushing out with their wingers and the fullback's gonna push up a little bit here. This guy is gonna make this pass into here. What's gonna happen in this situation, if this was real, is that Mura will make this sort of run after the pass is gone. He'll bend his run, because that's what players do. And the reason for that is when the ball goes here, he now is covering the pass back. The ball can't go back to this guy. Hoiberg, in this situation, pushes out to become a sort of extra forward. So these guys will move over a bit like this. So the, the shape goes from being a 4-3-3, very much like this, to suddenly being pretty much a 4-2-4. Skip will come along with this guy, Ali's here, this is what they do. And uh, Mura will come over to maybe block this pass over back here, like that. So it won't be exactly this line, but he'll make sure that guy is blocked here. And then what happens is that, say Skip and Ali are over here, this guy will move into space to try and get ahead to offer some sort of pass forward, maybe like this. But what happens is that Sanchez will step up to get close to this guy. So Skip and Ali maintain their, th their three, you see? So Sanchez is a two here, but when the ball is, when Tjolberg comes across, across to try and block this, this gives, uh, it means that this guy has suddenly got a friend on him. He can't do anything with the ball. The ball then has to go back or he's trapped because it won't go through here either, and that's a turnover. And then suddenly Spurs can break with Mura, Kane, Son, and they can break as quickly as they can with all the fun and glee in the world of a counter-attack team. And uh, that's what they want to do. They want to exploit turnovers and set these sorts of traps. Now, the other thing that I think is interesting, and one of the big differences in how Nuno's team plays compared to others is that Deli Ali is suddenly one of the hardest working defensive players in the entire team. Now Nuno has said that the midfielders always pressure. This is the big difference from his spurs to previous ones. And that this front three, they don't actually do a lot off the ball. They mostly are there to show the ball wide. So if they're here, this guy can't really go forward in the middle because it's congested. The ball has to go to wide areas. And that's why Nuno's team stays quite narrow, you see. Deli Ali, who we think of as a 10 or an eight, has made uh, more pressures than any other t player in the Spurs team. 106 pressures so far, that's in four league games, it's more than anyone else. 
And the weird thing about it is that although you often see him do so, well, Hoiberg goes to the right here to form the four, Ali does the same thing on the left. But we split the pitch into thirds. Most of Ali's pressures, 50 of them, have come in this third of the pitch. So although he's still a creative attacking player, and you'll often see when they go up the pitch, that Ali will come and dart around as a 10 behind Kane maybe, basically fill any gaps that need filled. He is one of the hardest working players in the entire team at getting back. And uh, that kind of hard work is why he is in the team ahead of players like maybe Ndombele, who you think of as being a particularly skillful player. He's not really got into the team yet. So I thought that was interesting. Deli Ali is sort of back. Um, but the front three do most of the attacking, supported by fullbacks. Deli Ali, Hoiberg, and Skip are mostly kind of defensive pressure players. So if you think of the way Liverpool functioned under Klopp for a few seasons, you'd have that kind of busy midfield three. They're not dependent to create chances, they're mostly there to stop counter-attacks and win the ball back in midfield because a lot of what Nuno's team is built around taking advantage of turnovers in possession so they can then attack those spaces. Um, we also saw the 4-4-2 diamond against Palace and we should look at why he used that in particular. So Sun was injured for the game. Now we know that Deli Ali likes to play as a 10, creating this sort of formation kind of does that. It means that Spurs straight away have two forwards, one great finishing, one really quick. It's a good kind of pair of a mix. They don't have Sun, didn't play Bergvine. And it means that Ali can get into these situations here where he can still make these sort of movements in behind to help support a three. And it's basically a front three. Again, think of Liverpool. It's a 4-3-3, but in uh, years gone by, it's also been a midfield diamond because you have a six pulls back here and you've got two midfielders in here very tight. So Winks and Hoiberg protect in the middle, they congest the middle, that forces play wide again, because the front two forces play wide, and then Hoiberg comes across to help with this. You still got Skip and support, and Winks can come over, Ali can drop back. So it's got lots of cover all over the pitch. It relies on the wing backs getting forward, but in this formation, you think against Palace that Spurs are the better team and so should be able to get their fullbacks higher up the pitch. It wasn't how it worked, and it ended up being really congested, they had no width, uh, they lacked energy in the middle of the pitch and Palace were, I don't think they were better in the first half, the, the game was boring basically, it was boring. Um, and that's not dissimilar to <laughs> some of Nuno's earlier Wolves teams. And you think, well, you maybe play in Dombley in there or something, he'll give you something different. But in Dombley's more likely to try something that makes him lose the ball and they turn over possession and Palace can counter-attack. So forget the red cards that Tanganga had against Palace. Before that even happened, they weren't amazing, they weren't very creative similar in the past to Mourinho's sorts of teams. And that brings me on to my next point. Is Nuno Espirito Santo just the next Mourinho? Is he, is he Mourinho 2.0? So comparing Nuno to Mourinho is uh, kind of easy. He played under him at Porto. He's a goalkeeper. Uh, I think mostly a reserve goalkeeper actually. But he played under him at Porto in the 2000s. Um, he's also Portuguese. There's never a lazy uh, comparison to make. But the things they share in common are that they want to maximise control of games and minimise risk. They don't want to have these situations where there are dice rolls where an opponent can get an advantage. And that often leads to games being quite dull, they're not frenetic, they're not end-to-end. -end. If you have control of the game, it just needs the opponent to make one mistake, you can take advantage and that's how you get a 1-0 win or a 1-0 advantage. And then the team has to push to try and get you and you can sit back, recoil and spring because they leave space behind. Now, the team, you know, it's, it's changed a few times. Uh, it sounds like Nuno wants to play a 4-4-2 diamond sometimes, he, something he used at Porto, as did Mourinho, but it's mostly been this 4-3-3, which is what we've seen with Spurs when it's tended to work with them this season. But other similarities between the two managers are that they want to create this us-v-them um, LCD sound system bunker approach. That's the kind of thing they want to do, and it's all off-the-pitch stuff. I can't show you on a tactics board because I can't show you mentality. But something to consider is that at Wolves, Nuno was in charge for 114 games and in those games Wolves scored almost twice as many goals in the second half as he did the first half. 87 goals in the second half, 47 in the first. So he likes to watch what the opponent does and then adapt and go from there. He kind of saw it against Palace. Games are really dull in the first half but he's just learning what they're doing so he can make small changes and they can go from there. Uh, and that's something that we seem to, seem to have seen already from Spurs. And one of the things as well is they don't really press very high at the pitch. They tend to engage a little bit deeper. If you press right here, if you've got Kay and Mura and Sun here, and you're trying to stop a team building out from the back, you're already leaving yourself with lots of space. 
So you have to cover lots of different parts of the pitch to be able to do this. It's not easy, it requires a lot of energy, and it means that the team, if they are good enough, can play through you. So if you start with a slightly deeper line, and again, this is not perfect spacing for what they actually do, but they'll largely sit kind of like this in a narrow front three, and the four, as we know, will come to help out to create a block either side. But in doing this, the opposition team can push out more. Kane will cover this six. So this is a 4-3-3 three, three that they're playing against here. I've made this up, but this is how it works. The central striker will largely block off this six. They stay narrow as this three, as you can see here, and them all highlighted. And what this does, the opposition team can then spread out a little bit. The fullbacks can move up. This team can get forward, but it leaves a crucial amount of space behind. So if there is a turnover from one of these traps, these guys have space to get in behind. If you start earlier in the, in the press up here, that space just doesn't exist. I'm going to have to delete it all because it's not there. And it depends like where your first line of engagement is. So they are pressing, but they're not pressing high up the pitch. They're engaging later and making sure that there is space to counterattack in. And it's all to do with how you want to control the game, but also to ensure that you're creating chances because the team is opened up behind their defence. That's why they want to do it. If they leave that space behind there, the narrow front three ensures that the ball is going to go wide, so we know where the space is. It's behind this line here. That's where the space to attack is. So if they show the ball to the wide areas, which is where they want to go, these X's mark the spot of the pressing trap, and that's where they will win the ball, and that's where they'll turn it over. It's why games become quite dull <laughs> quite quickly. However, it seems to work. So they played this same sort of system against Manchester City with this narrow front three, which showed play wide so they could try and start their trap in here. They didn't score their goal from this front three being here and forcing a turnover. They created a couple chances, but they scored their goal against Man City by hitting them on the counter-attack from a corner. Did it a couple of times. What seems to have changed under Nuno is that they're very organized out of possession. Their counter-attack looks very orchestrated and they always tend to attack in the sort of diamond shape that they, they make very quickly. Which is kind of a standard thing, and like in, in coaching you'd always want your players to form diamonds and triangles, because it gives you depth and width. The ball's headed away, and you've got Bergvine run straight through, you've got Sun who comes over to the right, and because of the way they're playing, you had Mura was supporting as the deepest player in the, in the diamond. You'll notice this if you watch the goal back. By the time they get to this final bit here, Bergvine is the furthest player forward, Mura is in here as a six, Ali is here, rotations of positions during the counter-attack, and Sun comes in here to shoot and score. That's, that's how they scored the goal. The thing with this game is that you think of Spurs of having beaten Man City with some master tactic. It wasn't. It was just a simple uh, early line of engagement or deeper line of engagement, keeping things tight and defensive, hitting them on the counter and taking advantage of that. And I mean, if you look at the expected goals for that game, 1.3 for Spurs to 2.41 for Man City. Man City underperformed and probably should have won. They missed a lot of chances. This does sort of does sort of work. Spurs have kept three clean sheets in the first three games. Then they got done 3-0 by Palace, but that was because they were down to 10 men, I would say largely. Um, so let's end this by asking whether Spurs are actually good. Are Spurs good now? I think they are absolutely perfectly medium. They look organised out of possession, the players seem energised, they're working hard, they look fit too, and that might be because Nuno is a, a big sports science guy, whereas Mourinho was not. So there's definitely been a bit of transition there. Rather than relying on the eye test and asking a player if he's okay, Nuno uses numbers and uh, makes sure his players are very fit also. One thing to consider about the Spurs team is they might look quite boring, but that often works. That kind of waiting for the opposition to make a mistake does work. Um, and although Nuno's, Nuno hasn't won anything apart from the championship with a team good enough to finish seventh in the Premier League, uh, he does know how to make a team that counter-attacks well. And in Spurs' game so far, so in the first three games, they averaged 44.8% of possession, which is the kind of numbers you'd expect from a team who is set up to play on the counter. Games will, <laughs> they will squish the life out of games and make it very hard to play through them. Um, but if they're given opportunities to counter-attack, they have the players there to be able to exploit that. It's, uh, it's alright, it's not amazing. They'll win a few games, they'll be okay. They've got Harry Kane, so that's good. And Deli Ali appears to be back and he's working really hard, so that's nice. But that's mostly how Nuno's Spurs look early on in the season. They're absolutely fine. They'll probably be middle-ish. They'll win some games, they'll lose some others. 
great fun to be a Spurs fan. Uh, and that's it for me. Thanks very much for watching. Um, yeah, please subscribe. We'd love that if you did that. And we'll see you next time or here on Tifo IRL. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. The Athletic is where the Manchester United reporters revealed the truth behind the club's Jadon Sancho transfer fiasco, where the Tottenham reporters brought you news of Gareth Bale's return before anyone else, where the Chelsea reporters told us three days before his sacking that Frank Lampard was on the verge of losing his job. And you can try it now for free for 30 days. See the link in the description.